What are the silent years? The silent years when you don't understand what's happening. You're not hearing from God. You're not seeing anything. You're not feeling anything. The devil's telling you that you're crazy. And you're trying your level best to hold on. I would imagine a lot of people here tonight are in some of those silent years. Verse 2, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and engrave it so plainly upon tablets that everyone who passes by might be able to read it easily and quickly as he hastens by. He's saying, be sure you keep the vision that you have for your life, the word that God has spoken to you, the promises that you find in the word of God. Be sure you keep them in front of you where you can see them often and see them quickly because there's so much going on in the world and there's so many lies that come from the enemy's camp that try to fly in and out of our brain so many circumstances that seem to disagree with the word of god that if we don't keep the vision that god's given us in front of us we're likely to forget all about it now you should have some kind of a dream goal or a vision for your life not everybody has a call to be in full-time ministry but everybody is called to come up higher Everybody is called to, to grow, to press on. Maybe your vision is to get out of debt. Maybe your vision is to see changes in yourself. You've seen areas in yourself that don't agree with the Word of God, and you want to see those changes. Maybe you're an angry person with a bad temper, and your vision is to, to have peace and joy and to really enjoy your life. Maybe you want to be an actor or an actress. Maybe you want to be a singer. Maybe you want to be a preacher maybe you want to be a missionary but whatever it is I hope that you have some kind of goal for your life and you need to keep that vision in front of you because Satan is a dream thief he always tries to get us to abort our dreams or something that's equally bad sometimes to have an untimely birth to try to bring things to birth ourselves instead of waiting on God and letting Him do what only He can do. How many of you agree it's a little hard to wait on God sometimes? <laughs> for the vision is yet for an appointed time, and it hastens to the end fulfillment. It will not deceive or disappoint, though it tarry, wait earnestly for it, because it will surely come. It will not be behindhand on its appointed day. The vision is yet for an appointed time. The interesting thing about the appointed time is that nobody knows when that is. It sounds very spiritual. Yea, I say unto you in due time. Yea, yea, I say unto you at the appointed time. And we get kind of excited because we think we got a word from God, but the truth is we still don't know anything. Because God is not going to tell us when. He wants us to trust Him that our times are in his hands. Maybe you have a child that you're believing God to do a work in, or a spouse, or a parent. When, God, when? I have no idea. Don't be so worried about when. Be more concerned about how you act while you're waiting. Do I need to say that again just to make sure nobody missed it? Don't be so concerned about when you're going to be, get your breakthrough. Be more concerned about how you behave while you're waiting. God has a purpose in everything that he's doing. Look at the proud, verse 4. His soul is not straight or right within him, but the rigidly just and the uncompr uncompromisingly righteous man shall live by his faith and in his faithfulness. Now the proud person will try to make things happen themselves, which is really bad. We see a situation with Abraham and Sarah where God had promised them a child and it was taking longer than they thought it should and so they got the bright idea, concocted a plan of their own and ended up with Ishmael, who was the child, the works of their flesh. He represents a whole covenant in the Bible of trying to have relationship with God through our own works. And finally, Isaac came, who was the child of promise. Ishmael's name meant man of war. Isaac's name means laughter. 
You can either have joy and laughter and enjoy your walk, or you can have war all the time. It depends on whether or not you want to take matters into your own hands and try to run your own life, or whether you want to wait on God and let God do what only God can do and do it right. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 that God is not pleased when we draw back in fear. That He will come at the right time. And in the meantime, He doesn't want us to give up or quit. He wants us to keep on keeping on. Now, I'm sure that many of you are in this time in your life that I will call silent years. Or maybe you could think about it as you're in the boat in a storm and Jesus is asleep in the bottom of the boat and you don't understand why in the world he's not saying anything to you, why he's not talking to you. I was saying something to the Lord a few years ago. God, I just don't, haven't, seen, I haven't heard anything in a long time. You know, why aren't you saying anything? And the thing that came to my heart is no news is good news. <laughs> I thought, praise the Lord, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing then. If you haven't heard anything from God for a long time, just keep doing what He told you to the last time you heard anything. Amen? If God wants to say something, He'll make Himself known. Every man or woman of God that we see in the Bible, every person that I know that is doing anything substantial in the kingdom or who has seen any kind of major breakthroughs in their life, has had to endure what I call silent years. God called me into ministry in 1976, probably in about the month of March or April. He had touched my life in a pretty profound way in February as I was crying out to him. And my relationship with God became more real to me than it ever had been before, although I was a church-going Christian. I knew about God, but I have to say I don't think I knew God, and there is a difference. To know God, you have to step out on His Word and have experience with God and see His faithfulness. It's amazing what you learn as you get experience with God. And as I listened to my first teaching back then, it was a cassette tape, it was a message called Cross Over to the Other Side. And I'd never heard anybody preach for a whole hour on one scripture and keep my interest. Matter of fact, I'd never heard anybody preach for a whole hour, period. We, did, we didn't get very long sermons. We got little snacks, little sermonettes. And the fact that somebody actually kept my interest for a whole hour was amazing to me. Well, I received a call from God while I was making my bed. It's interesting, if you just go about your business and do whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing right now, if God wants you, He'll let you know. I was making my bed. And whether I say I heard a voice or I had a dream or I had a vision, I think I could explain it to you more like this by saying I had an overwhelming desire, a captivating desire. Fill me. And the thing that I thought, and I believe it was God that put this in my mind, is someday I'm going to go all over the world and teach the Word. And I'm going to have a large teaching ministry helping people to know God. Now, I will say that from that day until this, which has been many, many, many years, that deep desire has never left me. Desire motivates us. Desire drives us. It's amazing what we'll do if we have a strong enough desire. That's why it's foolish to say, well, I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I can't do this. You know, if you have a strong enough desire to have a clean house, you'll clean it. If you have a strong enough desire to get out of debt, you'll get out of debt. And don't get mad at me when I say this. I'm not trying to be offensive to anybody. But if you have a strong enough desire to exercise, you'll exercise. If you have a strong enough desire to get yourself healthy and get your body in shape, you'll do it. We have to get over making excuses because all excuses do is just keep us going around the same mountain over and over and over again. It amazes me what desire has driven me to do over these past 30 some odd years. Well, I would have thought that this would have all just happened very quickly and I would have had some kind of 
traveling ministry right away, but the truth was, was for five years, I taught little home Bible studies, 20, 25 people. I had to quit my full-time job in order to prepare for ministry, and I thought surely God would miraculously increase our finances because of this great sacrifice I was making. However, for six years, we had to believe God for literally everything, and every month we had to have a miracle to pay our bills. I didn't say a week, two weeks, I said six years. And there were lots of times where I didn't understand, it didn't make any sense, I thought, well, God, if you've called me and I'm making these sacrifices, then why aren't you coming through? And I would cry and I would quit and give up and then I would get up and go on again and then I'd cry and I'd quit and give up and then I'd get up and go again because I could tell when I opened my mouth to teach the Word that God had anointed me to do it. You know when you're anointed to do something. It's very easy for you. I've never taken a lesson on how to preach, how to put a sermon together. I've never taken a lesson or had any kind of professional training on how to do this. I want to tell you when I open my mouth, it is the gift of God that is functioning through me and it amazes me as much as it does maybe anybody else. Five years, not a few days, five years, I taught a couple little home Bible studies. Didn't get any money for it. Nobody stuck around to help me clean the house up when they were gone. People found things to murmur and grumble and complain about, yes, even in a little Bible study. But they kept coming and I kept preaching and they kept coming and I kept preaching. Then at the end of five years, God said, behold, I do a new thing. And I thought, yes! Ooh! There we go. Whew. Well, for one year I did nothing. It was like God just neatly set me up on this shelf and I did absolutely nothing. So I was so confused. And so during that year, the devil convinced me that I needed to stop all this ministry stuff and just become a regular woman. So my neighbor started trying to teach me how to sew. And I talked Dave into planting tomatoes out in the backyard. And I was going to can tomatoes and make my husband's clothes. And that was a whole year of a nightmare. I hated the tomatoes. I hated the clothes. I made Dave a pair of shorts, and when I got finished, I had hemmed them this, going this way rather than that way, and the pockets were longer than the shorts. <laughs> Why don't you stop trying to do something you're not anointed for and start doing what you are anointed for? It was time to pick the tomatoes, and I had my canning equipment, and overnight a bunch of black bugs came in, and I guess they were black because the holes in the tomatoes were all black, and my tomatoes were destroyed. And I quick called my neighbor who just lived right next door, no further than right over there to the corner. I said, our tomatoes are destroyed. Bugs ate them all up. She ran outside and called me back. She said, my tomatoes are fine. Nobody, nothing, nothing happened to my tomatoes. Now I'm mad at God. God, why did you not protect my tomatoes? He said, I have no obligation to protect your tomatoes. I never told you to grow tomatoes. <laughs> so that was a year that was just foolishness. And I thought nothing was happening. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. But you know what? Something was happening. Because you know what I learned in that year that I had to learn before I could go to the next level? I had to learn not to compare myself with anybody else and not to feel like that I had to be anybody other than me Whatever regular is, I didn't have to try to be what the world thought was regular. I needed to follow God and just be as radical as I could possibly be if that's what God was calling me to do. I, God did so much in that year, but He didn't do anything in my circumstances. He did something in me. And if you don't think that anything is happening in your life, Maybe it's because you're only looking around at your circumstances. Maybe you should take a look at what's happening on the inside of you. How you behave in the silent years really determines your future. Just because you have a call on your life doesn't mean you will fulfill that call. Many are called and few are chosen. There is a price to pay. Not everybody's willing to pay it. Jesus paid the price for our salvation, but if we want to carry God's anointing, which is the presence of His Holy Spirit on our life, there is a price to pay. You will have to live a different life than the one that you're used to living. 
And God will have to teach you. And many of the things that he wants to teach you, you can't learn in, in seminary. You can't learn in Bible college. You have to learn it from God and God alone. Many of the most valuable lessons I learned in my life, God taught me in the grocery store of all places. And I don't have time to get into all that, but God will teach you wherever you're at. Jesus had silent years. Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And at the end of the eight days, when the baby was to be circumcised, he was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, the mother's purification, the baby's dedication, they came according to the law of Moses and they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Okay, here we see Jesus. He was eight days old. And if you go on over to verse 39, it says, And when they had done everything according to the law of the Lord, they went back into Galilee to their own hometown. I'm in Luke chapter 2, verse 39. And verse 40, And the child grew <laughs> and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace, favor, and spiritual blessing of God was upon him. So we see Jesus when he's eight days old. And interestingly enough, you're about to find that we don't see or hear one word about Jesus in the Bible again until he's 12 years old. And all the Bible says, all it says about him, all it tells us about what he did was he grew. <laughs> Ouch. Growing hurts. He grew in every way. He grew in wisdom. He grew in stature. He grew in spiritual strength. He grew in favor with God and with man. And then, when he was 12 years old, in verse 42, they went up as was their custom, and when the feast was ended and they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, and his parents didn't know that he stayed behind. And they traveled three days' journey, and when they realized that Jesus was not with them as they were returning home, they, of course, became upset as any parent would, and they went back searching for him. And when they found him, they said to him, verse 46, after three days they found him, came upon him in the court of the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking, their, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished and overwhelmed and bewildered with wonder. He already had the hand of God on his life. He already had the anointing of the Holy Spirit on his life and his intelligence and understanding. And when they, verse 48, Joseph and Mary saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, child, why have you treated us like this? Here your father and I have been anxiously looking for you, distressed and tormented. And he said to them, how is it that you had to look for me? Did you not know that it was necessary as a duty for me to be in my father's house and occupied about my father's business? However, I find something very interesting. It obviously wasn't time for him to be about his father's business because they took him home. And he stayed there another 18 years. And all the Bible says is that he grew. So even Jesus, and it's not sinful to want to get about doing what you believe that you're supposed to be doing. When you have a call of God on your life or something that you believe that God wants you to do, you can be so full of it that if you're not careful, you can just get right in the flesh and start trying to do things out of God's timing. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? It's so easy to have an untimely birth. Or to just get so discouraged that you just throw in the towel and quit and give up. Let me tell you something. It doesn't take any special talent to give up. Anybody can do that. But you have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to help you press through and do things that ordinary people could not do. Now maybe you have to have been through some things to really hear what I hear when I see those two words and he grew. 
But I know the pain of those 12 years of waiting between 8 years old and 12 years old. And I can imagine how he wanted to get about his father's business. And yet his parents took him home. And look at verse 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and I love this, and was habitually obedient to them. See, some of us have to learn to be habitually obedient to the authority that we're under right now before God ever releases us to be in authority over anybody else. Okay, I'm going to come over here and talk to you because you guys are the only ones that are getting it. We have such a massive problem in the world today with rebellion. I mean, nobody wants anybody telling them anything. Everybody wants to do their own thing, have their own business, run their own life, work their own hours, do what they want to, dress the way they want to, do, you know, no, no guidelines, no rules, no regulations, don't try to tell me what to do. And then half the time we get goofy enough to try to spiritualize it. Well, you know, whom the, whom the son is set free is free indeed. <laughs> I'm just being led by the Spirit. Now, if you're really being led by the Spirit, you'll know how to come under authority. You have to, get to, you have to grow. Everybody say grow. grow. We have to grow to the point where we can do what an authority over us tells us to do even if we don't want to, even if we don't agree with them, and I'm not talking about sinful things, but even if we don't agree with them, and we have to do it with a good attitude and a smile on our face, wait a minute, I ain't done, and we have to not talk about them behind their back. Now, I think I better just sit down and talk to you like a mama for a while. See, the second thing that God did, the next level of my ministry, was I went to work at a church in my city. It was a new church, and I was 36 then, and the man that was pastoring the church was a young man, 26. And, you know, to be honest, when you're 26 and 36, you haven't learned too much yet. You think you know everything, but you don't know anything. And here I was, this big mouth, aggressive woman that God put in his church. And he was a young man that had a type A personality just like me. And let's just let it suffice to say that we had a few conflicts over the years. <laughs> but him and his wife blessed me and they, they let me start a women's Bible study there. And that grew to about 400 ladies every week coming. And that eventually turned into going on radio on one station. And then eventually after five years, God told me it was time to go north, south, east, and west, and, you know, the rest of its history from there. One radio station, station turned into eight more, and then finally 150, and then we went on weekly TV, and then daily TV, and, you know, on and on and on and on, and so here I am 35 years later. But there's no way that I can tell you what it took to get here in the amount of time that I have tonight. And it's easy to sit and say, well, I wish I had a ministry like Joyce. Well, you're not going to get it wishing. Well, I wish I looked like that lady that has 4% body fat. Well, she didn't get it wishing either. Man, I, I, I really wish when I'm 71 that I'll look as good as Dave Meyer. Well, he didn't get it wishing. He's been working out for 50 years. He eats right. He's happy. He doesn't worry. He's a blessing to people. Let me tell you something. The more you act the way God tells you to act, the better you're going to look and the younger you're going to look. And one of the things that I had to learn was how to come under authority with a good attitude. Even when I didn't think what I was being told was right, even if I didn't think I was being treated fairly or right, and I had to learn to do it with a smile on my face, a good attitude in my heart, and I had to learn not to talk to anybody in a downgrading way about that authority that was over me. And I, I may just camp here for a while if you don't convince me that you've got this because until you get this, there's no point in going any further.
How many of you are under some kind of authority right now that you don't agree with and it's hard for you? Well, looky there. And you know, even if you're somewhere where you're being mistreated, I can tell you what God will teach you out of that. He'll teach you how it feels to be mistreated so when you come into a position of authority, you won't mistreat people like you've been mistreated. Can I tell you something? Surprise, God knows what he's doing. Well, I pray that today's teaching has inspired you to keep your goals in front of you, but also to wait on God to do what only he can do in your life. It's 6 a.m. and another sweltering day in Prasat, Cambodia. A number of people have already gathered outside the entrance to the Hand of Hope Health Center, some arriving as early as 5 a.m. For Dr. Yim and his team of doctors and medical staff, it's a typical weekday for treating some of Cambodia's most impoverished for a multitude of health issues that range from injuries, malnutrition, to diseases, it was for this very purpose that the Hand of Hope Hospital and on-site pharmacy opened March of 2009. For Kim Savuth, the Hand of Hope Center was his only hope. After a trek into the mountains to find wood to sell in support of his family, he returned home with symptoms of chills and fever. <laughs> Alarming news for Kim. For him and others in the Prasad area, it's nearly impossible to get medical treatment without the free services of Hand of Hope Health Center. Adverse living conditions are commonplace in the area surrounding Prasad. The Savuth family's level of poverty is so startlingly bleak that they can barely afford the basic necessities to survive. The day we visited Kim, their meal was a rat that Kim's mother cooked on an open fire. Kim 